Our uh, title today, The Mirror, Glancing or Looking Intently. Last week we were in our Revelation class studying the message uh, to the church in Philadelphia. And one of the uh, pluses for that church, as Jesus said, uh, was that they were dedicated to the Word of God. And there were two great uh, cross-references that we had in our materials, one from the, book, uh, from the Gospel of Matthew and the other from the book of James. And today what I'd like to do is for us to really fix our gaze and our focus on those two uh, sets of scriptures. Now what precedes Matthew chapter uh, 7 verse 24 and is towards the ends of, end of the Sermon on the Mount, what precedes this verse that I'm going to read is this. Jesus said, and it's sort of labeled uh, the true and false disciple. Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will come to me on that day, say, Lord, Lord, did I not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles. Then I will tell them plainly, Jesus says, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. And this is where we pick up next in this uh, Sermon on the Mount. Jesus continues and says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and put them into practice is like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. And literally in the original language, it, it is the rock, it is the word Petra, which does not mean a, a stone or a, may, maybe even a boulder, but it means something that is huge. Or, because I'm from Chicago, it's huge. Or huge. Okay, I throw that H in there. Uh, but it's a great rock formation. It's something that is humongous. Uh, like, it, like in a cliff or in a, a ridge or a mountain. It's something that is so steadfast and sturdy. So Jesus' point here is that, is that this rock, and some think that it is Jesus Christ. I think that's a great idea. And I, I agree with that. But I, even better, I think it is... This rock is the word of God. It is the word of Jesus Christ himself. And it is the stability for us as believers. It is a stability for true disciples as we put ourselves in that genuine subjection to Jesus Christ and his words. And here the wise man builds his house, really represents a person who builds their life. What is it built on? Is it built on the words of Jesus Christ? Is our life built on the words of Jesus? The wise man uh, acted on those words of Christ. I'm sorry, acted on those words and building on a rock, building on God's word is something that is so powerful in our lives and I think as we go along I think there's something that every one of us wrestle with at times just as you being a human being or maybe especially because we are in Western civilization. So Jesus says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into a practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And Jesus continues, the rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against the house, and it did not fall because it had its foundation on that rock. I don't know about you, but I think sometimes... Uh, at least for me, those preliminary crises that go on in my life uh, really uh, reveal how authentic my faith is. You know, it's easy on Sunday mornings where we go to Bible study, whatever the case may be. We, I mean, don't you feel close to Jesus right now? Raise your hand. Don't you feel close? Yeah, this is great. But what happens is when crisis comes, I think many a times it reveals uh, the authentic or inauthentic uh, spirituality of Jim Pratke. Because only in times of crisis can a person's faith be really proven out. So what we're seeing um, in this verse right here, a little bit of a breakdown is this. The rain descended from above. The floods came in from below. The winds blew sweeping across and beat the house from every direction. Has your life ever been like that? Have you ever thought to yourself, I, I, I'm getting hit from every direction. Have you ever been there? 
Or maybe you have one thing go on and think, well, I can't get any worse than this, right? And then you have something coming from another direction. And sometimes there's multiple crises going on at the same time. And Jesus is saying, for the person who built uh, their house on that rock foundation of his words, on Jesus Christ himself, we see that the house, it, it fell not. It didn't fall. Because its foundation was on a rock. And Jesus is making that connection to his words. But on the flip side, Jesus makes a comparison. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. And sand really is the definition of all kinds of teachings and doctrines, homespun philosophies, and excuses that are not the words of Jesus. I mean, really, think about it. We either have the words of Jesus and we can live by them, or there are so many voices that opt, you know, to, to they just want to get into our hearts and minds. And we can adopt so many of these teachings, these philosophies and excuses, and they're not the words of Jesus. So there's two opposing forces, and we know this. All other ground is sinking sand. Sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. So Jesus said, but everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew, and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Now, take note, it's completely the same. The same scenario. And I think in Jesus' illustration, it's the same area. But there is a difference. The difference is the foundation. It fell. It fell. This word fall, original language, uh, I think I've got a little clip on it, means to, uh, to fall upon and to strike. And the idea is that this happened quickly. As soon as the wind came, as soon as the water rose, uh, as soon as the tempest came, the, that house stumbled against, against its own weak foundation. And then we read on top of that, if that wasn't enough, and great was its fall. And if we're honest, haven't we too often seen not just houses, but the ruins of a house, but a life that has stumbled against a weak foundation of the world? Too often, and, and, and sadly to say. So we have these hearers of Jesus as he's speaking to them. And he's dividing them into two different, two different groups. He's dividing them, I believe, as one day he will divide the nations. Some that hear and do, they act on what they hear. And then the others that hear and do not respond or do not act. Because he is now reaching and preaching to those of a mixed multitude, mixed audience, and he separates them one from the other. And the point is this. Our values will be shaped by our commitment to one or the other. Does that make sense? Our values will be shaped by a commitment to one or the other. Our values will be shaped by a commitment to Christ's word, or to the world. In the letter uh, of James, chapter 1, there's a section of this letter that's really basically dedicated to the idea of listening and doing. And what precedes our text for, in the book of James, I'd like to just read this. Uh, he wrote to Christians, uh, my dear brothers and sisters, so it's written to Christians, take note of this, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Does that sound good or what? We agree with that? We should be slow to speak, I'm sorry, quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Wow. Ever have those moments where you're, you're, you're feeling, you can, almost, you, can, you can almost see a person's the veins in their neck kind of popping out? You can almost hear a little like that, you know? No, that never happens here. That happens at Little Dump, right? Yeah. That happens at Little Dump. This is being recorded, isn't it? Okay. Just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. 
Uh, quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow, and slow to become angry. Uh, because anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and evil that is so prevalent uh, and humbly accept the word of God planted in you. See, when we become a Christian, the word of God is planted in us. And it can save us. And I think a few months ago, we had a message on um, the sower in the seed and the, the, uh, the, the soil type of the heart that receives the word of God. That is what this is talking about. Because when we come to Christ, the word of God is planted in a believer. And uh, it's, a, it's a dynamic event. It's a big deal. And it demands, it demands and calls for a dynamic response. It's called growth. It's called action. We respond. James continues, and he wrote, Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Do what it says. Now this do what it says literally means this. Become or keep on becoming doers of the word. Become or keep on becoming uh, doers, taking action, practicing the word of God as you hear it. It's not just hearing the word of God. It's not just hearing it. And this is where we have to be careful, myself included. We are all in the same boat here. Human beings in Christ, uh, maybe searching, searching possibly someone here today. But we have to be careful not to make the mistake that hearing maybe a good message or being involved in a good Bible study or being involved in uh, maybe a really good, some really good Christian material makes you grow just because you hear it or because you read it and that we're going to be blessed. It's not the hearing, it is the doing. The response to it that brings the blessings. There's a quote from, uh, I think it's Warren uh, Wearsby. He wrote, quote, Too many Christians mark their Bible, but their Bible never marks them. Too many Christians mark their Bible, but their Bible never marks them. There's no response, there's no action, there's no doing there's no effect. They may hear it, but there's no response. See, reading God's Word should produce in our lives a response. There is an examination, just as we have during the Lord's Supper. There should be an examination when we go to the Word of God. And we put up against the Word of God our lives. We examine ourselves against the light of Scripture. Go back to our text. Uh, James wrote, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Become doers of it. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and then looking at himself goes away and immediate forgets, immediately forgets what he looks like. And the key to this idea is the mirror. If we can understand this key thought. Because in the ancient world the mirror was a specially shaped uh, polished metal. But it was used to inspect. Uh, to decorate one's body, right? I mean, that's, isn't that why we go up to a mirror? Is to look intently. Maybe change something. We'd pay careful attention in front of that mirror, looking intently, every detail, to see what's wrong, right? <laughs> right? I mean, if you have an alfalfa, you know, and spanky in our game, I'll stick it up there. You might not put a little, you know, little bit of that on there, whatever. But the idea is to change what's wrong, is to inspect, to examine, to discern, so that we can correct it, right? I mean, that's why we stand in front of a mirror. I mean, you have to see what's going okay, but to see what's not going okay. And we don't glance. We look intently into the mirror if we want to see 
what is truly there, right? As Christians, as disciples, and the word disciple means a learner follower. Uh, a learner follower, you hear the word of God and then you respond in action and follow. As believers, we, we learn about ourselves when we look into the mirror of God's word. And that requires concentration. That mirror is God's word. Also for the purpose to see what's wrong. To discern how we should correct our lives. So that we can change. But it only happens by gazing. Not glancing. If you really don't want to look in that mirror and see how you're really looking, you'll have to give it a glance, right? If you really want to see what is going on for the purpose of knowing the truth, you gaze, you look, and you concentrate. See, what happens when we only glance at the mirror or God's Word, we forget. We forget. There's no lasting impression. And so we can go on our, our way without any conviction or depth. Have you ever done this? Uh, maybe looking at something that's bright, just gazing at it for a few moments, just gazing at it like a t television screen, and then all of a sudden you close your eyes and you look somewhere else, and you still have that imprint? Maybe the, just the uh, silhouette or maybe just uh, the framing of it? That's because you were gazing. You were concentrating. You were looking intently. That does not happen when you glance at something and close your eyes. This term uh, in verse uh, 23, looking at his face in the mirror, a, a more literal translation is this. <clears throat> this person perceiving the face of his birth of him in the mirror. Sounds a little weird, but the idea is looking at his natural face. Maybe that face that he's looked at or she has looked at over and over again throughout the years. Knowing that face so clearly as it's maturing, yes. But something that should be so familiar. <coughs> excuse me, because there's been so many opportunities to gaze and to concentrate and to look intently into that mirror. But if it's only a glance, habitually, continually... Walking away, that face is forgotten. It is not recognized. And there is a type of uh, amnesia that we can have spiritually, emotionally, when we fail to look intently into that mirror of God's Word. We forget who we are in Christ. And that happens when we glance quickly is not to see the flaws. I don't like to look at my flaws. How many like to look at their flaws? In fact, we talked at a men's group one time how, how often, just human nature, we will work on the things we're really good at. Like we needed to get better at them, right? <laughs> the things that we're terrible at, or we, don't, we don't work on them a bit. Because we don't like our flaws. We don't want to face our flaws. And if we don't want to face our flaws, then we just glance at the mirror. If we want to face our flaws, we just glance at the Word of God. And we don't look intently into it. We don't look and want to see what is deeply going on. Maybe it's disobedience. Who knows? And yes, there, there is a, a sense in our lives as Christians... Just so we don't misunderstand, there is a progress, there is a sense of development in Christian growth. No doubt. And sometimes uh, doing what scripture says is a battle, and sometimes it's not even a matter of how quickly we act, but the fact that sometimes there is no action at all. And that's dangerous. That is dangerous. Faith must be demonstrated. It must be lived out. You were bought with a price. So was I. And so how easy it was for James and for his hearers, listeners, as it is for us today, as we hear to fall away from the wisdom of Scripture that requires us to live out our true faith through action. 
when we, in reality, we gaze intently into the mirror of God's word, we see ourselves as we truly are. But when we only glance at that mirror, at the word of God, we can emotionally, spiritually, intellectually deflect that truth. It will have no lasting impression by glancing. Uh, really pull up some thoughts from uh, Wearsby. Uh, he had made a comment or in his writing that there were uh, three mistakes that Christians make. And boy, I have, I have fallen in and fit into all three categories in my Christian walk. First one is this. They merely glance at themselves. They do not study themselves as, the re as they read the word of God. They merely glance at themselves. They do not study themselves as they read the word of God. Boy, let me just ask you a question. How many of us here today, sometime in your life, have listened to a message and thought to yourself, I so wish so-and-so heard this message? <laughs> Raise your hands. I mean, if we're honest, you know, if we're honest, right? That's the whole point of point number one. Haven't we been there? They merely glance at themselves. They do not study themselves as they read the Word of God. Number two, they forget what they see. If they look deeply into their heart in Christ, you know, what they would see would be unforgettable. Unforgettable in Christ. And third, they fail to obey what the Word tells them to do. They think hearing is the same as doing. They think hearing is the same as doing, and it's not. Amen? So James wrote, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in uh, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Because you know what? We can read instead of doing, right? We can do the talk instead of doing. Instead of acting. And as believers, we need to be serious. We need to look into the mirror of God's word. Those building blocks for the house, which is our life. We need to look intently at the word of God. And no quick glance in the mirror will do. The question is, uh, why, in verse 25, as we start to close, why is this called the perfect law that gives freedom? Or liberty? The answer is because when we obey it, when we do it, which means we trust it, God sets us free. Jesus said to his disciples, or to those who were listening in the crowd, to the Jews who had believed Jesus, Jesus said, if you hold, if you continue, if you abide in my teaching, you are really my disciples then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. free.